everybody. It's 2 o'clock Eastern Time. Let's get started. Um, today we are talking about modifying receipts in CounterPoint. I am here with John Dempsey. Um, he's going to be presenting the bulk of our of our material today because he's the support genius. So I'm your host. My name's Ariel Leggett. I'm, in, I'm an account manager here for many of you that are on the webinar today. And I'm joined by John Dempsey. RCS support really doesn't do his title justice. He's pretty much a genius. And um, I don't know what we would ever do if he didn't work at RCS. So he's chained to his desk most of the time. He's not allowed to leave. So again, we're going to be talking about modifying receipts. And these are the specific topics we're going to cover. We're going to do an overview of the CounterPoint Receipt Editor. So these are all tools within CounterPoint that you can use to customize your receipts for your business. Nothing extra you have to purchase or do outside of CounterPoint. It's all stuff that you can do inside of CounterPoint. Um, so we'll go over that receipt editor, adding logos, adding fields, specifically custom fields, adding formulas, formatting data. We'll go over some if statements, which those can kind of trip me up sometimes. So John has some, some cool tricks to show you all with those. And then we'll be talking about suppression as well. And I don't really have much else to say, so I'm just gonna hand it off to John, and he is going to dive into CounterPoint, and he's gonna show us what he has to show us today. Let me let him have control of this show. All right, you should all be able to see CounterPoint up on John's screen, and we're ready to roll. Good afternoon, everyone. This is John, and welcome to the webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking, as Ariel mentioned, uh, about modifying receipts. And before we dive into modifying receipts, I want to talk really, really quickly about how CounterPoint kind of builds its directory structure and where it puts things. And the reason for this quick little sidebar is just so you have a way of making backups of, of what you modify and a way to recover either to a previous backup or back to the original. So if you're looking at my screen, you can see I'm browsed down to my CounterPoint's top level directory. And when CounterPoint installs, it installs a system directory inside that top level folder. And that system folder kind of contains the default uh, items for that that CounterPoint relies on, whether it be labels, label queries, invoice forms, all of the standard reports, point of sale forms, RDLC receipt forms, they're all parked inside this system folder. You'll notice I also have a couple of different company folders here, and today we're going to be playing in the test golf folder. And so within my system folder, there's a PS forms folder, which stands for point of sale forms. So this would be invoices, uh, order forms, picking tickets, packing slips, um, layaway forms, and the one that I want to point out that's in here is going to be kind of the basis for what we're going to be manipulating today, and that's the receipt1.rdlc, uh, um, so rdlc is a report definition file. And so this original was dated back to November of 2017. Nothing should ever really modify the receipt form that's in the system folder. This is the, uh, the original that you can always run back to if you get into trouble. Uh, any changes we make to this are going to be copied to our top-level directory. So it's going to wind up getting copied over to my test golf configuration PS forms folder. And you'll notice at this point I've got a couple backups of that RDLC file in here, but I don't have a receipt1.rdlc in here. So I'm starting just absolutely from scratch. We'll park that. And so in CounterPoint, I'm going to jump into setup and point of sale. And then within point of sale, I'm going to jump into form groups. And the form group I'm going to be working on right now is the ticket form group. You may also do this with the order form group or with uh, any other form group that you might want to modify the RDLC form uh, within. So that could be a, um, a pay on account form or a, a pay in or pay out form that would use a different RDLC form than the standard customer receipt. Um, but on the receipt RDLC line, uh, if I select the line, there's a link to the form editor. So the form editor is an external tool from CounterPoint which allows us to modify the form. 
This is not something that you have to purchase. This is something that's included with CounterPoint, unlike Crystal Report Writer, which would allow you to modify invoices or purchase order forms. The receipts are all modified using CounterPoint's utility. So at this point, as soon as I hit that button, it's going to ask to create a custom form. And what this is doing is it's copying the file from the system directory into my test golf point of sale forms folder. And from there on forward, it will use, instead of the standard form, it will use the modified form. I don't have to name it anything different. Um, and that has been copied. And now I'm looking in my form editor at receipt1.rdlc. And this file now lives, if I jump back over to my test gal, what a sale form, CS form folder, it's created this new file, receipt1.rdlc, and it's dated today. So a quick overview of the receipt editor. Uh, can I hide this a little bit? Um, you can hide that. Uh, just, yeah. There you okay. go. Okay, because we're going to be using some of that. So a quick overview of what you're looking at on the screen. Obviously, in the center is the layout of the actual receipt. We'll talk about that in detail. On the left-hand side, uh, we have a, a couple different things we want to talk about. We have access to our data. So item number, descriptions, long descriptions, additional descriptions, prices, discounts, anything that uh, is in the database that we can print is accessible from the data section. And under controls, we have a couple different things. We can drop in text boxes, so we can print the word ticket number or station number or user ID or sales rep. We can drop in images. We can drop in either a bitmap file we can drop in an image field or a preloaded logo. And we'll talk a little bit about those three different images. The horizontal rule is just a bar uh, printing across the, the receipt, so it can segment one section of the receipt from another. The barcode, which is usually printed at the bottom of the receipt, uh, which indicates the document ID number, but we can use that for other purposes as well, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the paper cut, which is going to be down at the very bottom of my receipt, Notice on the preview on the bottom of the receipt, there's my barcode, and below that, there's a little pair of scissors that cuts the paper. The other thing that's over on the left-hand side are the sections. And from the sections, um, we can either hide sections or duplicate section, session, sections uh, or change the order of the section. So, for example, in the body of my receipt, I've got a header section, a gift card section, items, and you can read this as well as I can, but totals. And if I want to put my store value cards up next to my gift cards, I can click on the store value cards, and I can move that section up. And I can reorder my sections or I can watch the wheel spin. Well, we're waiting for that. Over on the right-hand side. It went up one. Yep. Yeah. Good. I'm going to move that back down. Over on the right-hand side, uh, most of the important information over on the right-hand side is going to be in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, in the upper section, it just says that it's a ticket receipt, who, who created it, which is NCR. It gives the dimensions of the receipt. The receipt is 42 columns wide. That's an important number to keep, keep track of, um, just in terms of if you're going to print long descriptions or uh, additional descriptions, which might be 50 or 80 characters, you're only going to fit 42 up to 42 columns across the receipt. So if you're going to print something mm -hmm. that's beyond 40 characters or 42 characters, you're going to have to split that up into multiple lines. Um, but the real meat of the right-hand side is down this bottom right-hand corner. And so that allows us to control the formatting of each individual element on the receipt. 
So in the right-hand corner, it's showing us the location of each. Uh, so if I click on, so uh, for example, uh, the word item number, which is in my header section, and it's just a column heading that prints the word item. Uh, that's showing me that it is um, six columns wide, takes up one row. Uh, it's on the 18th row of my header section. I don't really need to see that. I can drag and drop things. I don't really need to use this to, to move the position, but I could if I wanted to. It also allows me to control whether it's bolded, whether it's in italics, underlined, things of that nature, so some text formatting. The RDLC form editor is not a Windows WYSIWYG form editor. You can't use Windows fonts and Windows formatting. It's really more of an XML formatting. So if I wanted to make my item number bold, I can click on where it says true. This. You can just drag it down to the bottom and hide it completely. I can click on my bold and change it from false to true. Other formatting commands we can play with. So now that's bold. Uh, we can. You're probably not going to be able to change the color. The color choices are black and red. So if you have an old dot matrix printer that has two colors, or an impact printer like a kitchen printer. Yeah. So if you want modifiers and things like that, oh, that's a dot matrix printer. Yeah. I was trying to sound smart, John. <laughs> Better luck next time. <laughs> I'll keep trying. <laughs> uh, you can control italics. You can reverse the print. And I find reverse print is a really handy tool for making things jump out. And you probably wouldn't do this with your item number column. But if I change that, when I preview this, if it's in reverse print, it's going to print a black background with white letters. And if you really want something that jumps off the page, that tends to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, the other two big things that make it jump off the page are double high and double wide. And double high and double wide are ways that you, really the only way you can increase the font size of a field. So many of you will have your store description in double high and double wide. So your store description up top is in double high and double wide. You can make the letters just tall, but not additionally, not, not extra wide. I had a support call today from someone who uh, is losing characters off of their store description. It's cutting off the O in San Francisco um, when they combine that with the store name. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the receipt is 42 columns wide. Well, you're only going to get about 20 characters if you go double wide, especially if you go bold. So bold and double wide take up more than twice as much space on the receipt. Um, something around here a little bit too much. But the last thing I want to mention in here is this can grow. And what can grow means is that it can take up additional lines on the receipt. And this is useful for things like long descriptions or additional descriptions or notes, where you want to not cut off after 42 characters, but you want to span down to multiple lines. So it's like text wrapping? Yes. OK. I have a question. What happened to the gift certificate section? Oh, I unchecked it. Oh, okay. Oh, and that's how you how you suppress. Yeah. Okay. No, back. Must be really slow. Good job. So, um, let's talk about adding fields to the receipt. So, I'm going to add a couple fields to the receipt. Um, just to have some fun. And the most important thing that people tend to want to print on the receipt, or one of the most important things that people want to print on the receipt is item information. So in my item section, if I click within the item section, you notice I don't have a great deal of room in the item section. So I want to give myself some space, some space to play with. So if I right click on a line, I can add additional lines to that section of the receipt. So I'm going to add two lines. So now I've got two blank lines that I can drag some stuff out to. So if I expand my data section, 
And notice when I've highlighted the item section, the data section deals with ticket line items. If I click up in the header section, now I'm in the data section, I'm looking at ticket information, not ticket line item information. If I click down into the payment section, I'm dealing with, I'm looking at ticket payment information, not ticket line information or not ticket information. So in the item section, I'm just going to drag out some additional fields just to show you what it looks like. Uh, so in my item section, I have access to ticket line information, so quantity sold. Uh, if you had serial numbers, the serial number information would be in there. If you had uh, custom prompts for things like date of birth or um, uh, other text that was prompted for um, when, when an item is sold, so point of sale prompt codes, those are in here as prompt code information. Um, the other thing that's linked into the ticket line section that's very handy is the item table. So the item table gives us access to everything that's in your item screen, in your item master setup screen. So things like categories and subcategories, long descriptions, additional descriptions. Uh, so let's find our long description and drag that in. So just hold button down, drag the field in. And there's my long description in my item section. And you'll notice it doesn't really take up the width of the receipt, but there are four corners on the field itself. And if I hover over one of those dots, I either get a left and right arrow or I get a four-way arrow as I hover over the field. If I get the four-way arrow, I can move that from one line to another, or I can move it left and right as an entire field. If I want to stretch that and make it the width of the receipt, I want to hover over one of the dots, so I get a left-right arrow or a two-way arrow, and just drag it wider. So now I'm taking up one row and 33 columns. And because the long description is wider than or potentially wider than my receipt, I might change that to can grow but true. So it might span over to a, wrap onto a second line on, on the receipt without overriding anything else. If I want to remove that long description, just click on it so it's selected, right click, and I can either delete the field, which gets rid of the field, or I can delete the entire line using the remove line function. While we're talking about fields, I want to mention something you know, about the data itself. So I mentioned that the data is, that you're seeing in the data portion is based on what section you're looking at. So if I click on into my header section, I'm going to see ticket information. The columns you're seeing in the data are a little bit alien from what you're used to. Uh, they're a little bit easier to read in terms of descriptions. They're not uh, fields with underscore, underscores and um, the things that you would be seeing in Crystal Report Writer or in uh, DB export, um, but you have access to the same fields that you would have access to from there. The other thing I want to point out is if you have modified your tables using the document extended tables or the doc line extended tables for custom fields, those values are available for the receipt editor as well. So in my ticket section, I have a custom properties folder. And that cut, the, the point of that custom properties folder is to contain custom fields in the ticket header extended table. If I go into my item section, in my ticket line, again, there's a custom properties. And here I have access to custom fields that were added to the doc line extended table. So if you've modified your tables, you can include that information on your receipt. Um, by drilling down into the custom properties folder. All right, so we talked about dragging fields in, moving them around. Uh, let's talk a little bit about some of those logos. 
So I mentioned there were three different Yeah. Yep. Yeah, look at corner. You can put it all the way down. I'm not good with computers. We're doing a little mini go to meeting so real here. One of the issues I've seen at a couple a couple customer sites recently uh, is that the header logo doesn't print on the customer's receipt. Um, I haven't really done too much digging into why that is, but the header logo that I have printing on the receipt here, if I preview this receipt, it's just going to show the word logo. And when the receipt executes, it's going to replace that word logo with the image that's in your device's setup. So in CounterPoint, in devices. Look at this. It's like you were prepared for this. I didn't have this screen up, and I had the other screens open. <laughs> devices takes a minute to load. Uh, but in devices, uh, um, under the receipt section, and I don't have a receipt printer, uh, but in the receipt printer, there's a field for a header logo or a footer logo, and that's what links to the RDLC form. And I've had some cases where that logo doesn't print, and if that happens, what I typically do is I remove the header logo, just delete the field, and I replace it with a bitmap file. So if I wanted to do that, I would add a line, drag in the bitmap file, and this just allows me to browse to whatever folder my image is located in. And I usually tip, I try to keep my image files in the same folder as my, um, my forms themselves. So I would put that into my top level test golf config ps forms folder, and that's where I would find my picture file. Let's see if I have one in another company. So I just grabbed another image for, for starters. So that shows up as an embedded image as opposed to the header logo. The header logo is linked to the devices set up in the header logo field. The embedded image is linked to the file in the directory, and that gets embedded into the receipt. Uh, so if that file gets moved, it doesn't get chopped off of the receipt. Um, but looking at that embedded image, notice it automatically filled up the full width of the, the receipt. So it's going to be centered on the receipt uh, and scaled to the side of the receipt. Um, so there's really not much else I have to do with that. It does not display when we preview the receipts, though, just like the header logo. The other image that's available is a very specific image. And that image is actually the customer's signature for credit card processing. This image field is not linked to item images or variable-based images. It is a variable-based image, but the only one they've actually linked it to is typically already on the receipt, and it's right down here in the payment section. It's the customer signature. So I wanted to point out what that was. Um, I have a quick question. So say you did not want the receipt to print with a copy of the customer signature, you could just delete that line. Okay. Correct. That's good to know. And next thing I want to do over here is I want to kind of put more of a bar between the components being sold to the customer, so items, store value cards, gift certificates, and the total section. I might also want to put a bar between the total section and the payment section. So if I click on my total section, right click, and add one line, and there already is a series of hyphens over here, but I think that looks a little cheesy. So I can drag in the horizontal rule. And now I have a bar between sections. Can you make that dashed, or is it only solid? If you wanted to make a dashed bar, 
you would use hyphens or underscores. Oh. And again, I'd add a line and drag in a text box. And then add it. And then just add the text add box. 42 of them. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I have some questions about the logos. Um, is there a recommended image format for the best results, like PNG or bitmap? Or I would JPEG? go. With, I would go with either a monochrome or a 16 color bitmap. It should be fairly low um, res and, and low quality, um, so the, the file size is smaller. If the image is, you know, too large in terms of file size, it'll slow your receipts down. Now, how about printing or uploading um, a logo using the bitmap file embedded in the receipt? Is that slower to print than using the header logo? Um, I haven't benchmarked the two. I, I, I would think the embedded image would probably be faster than the header logo, uh, but I haven't seen any speed issues between the two or any noticeable difference between the two. Again, it's typically the same file I'm using for both scenarios, so it's downloading the same amount of data to the printer. Um, next thing I want to do is um, I want to drag in a couple fields, and this is kind of a common request. I'm going to remove these two up in the item section, these two blank lines. Uh, well, that's fine. Put them there. No, I'm going to put them down below. So notice the item section kind of jumps around the cells and the serial numbers. The cells and the serial section are sub-selects within the item group. Uh, but I want to put some blank lines below the bottom of this just to make this a little bit longer. So I'm going to add two more lines. And what I want to put down there is some savings information. This is kind of a common request. You know, request. Uh, people don't necessarily like the you save messages that CounterPoint provides, and they want to create their own calculation or their own savings information. And the other reason is um, you'll notice that the CowerPoint savings information in the item section does not factor into account savings based on document discounts. So if you've got items on sale or price overrides, those will show up in the line item savings section, but if the customer gets a 10% discount off the entire ticket, that savings amount isn't expressed there. So I want to take that into account. So in these two blank lines, I want to print, you know, you know, a, a compare at price of, so we can print price one and a use save message that includes any type of savings. So the first thing I'm going to drop in is just a text box. And so I've dropped in a text box and I'm going to change the word text box to normal price or however you want to print that. So in the text box field, I'm going to change the word text box to normal price or everyday price. That sounds better. And the way I did that in the value field, just click on the ellipse and it brought up the field and I can change the text box to the word everyday price. And Notice it's cutting off the AY and price, so I'm going to drag that a little bit wider so we can see it all. And then I'm going to drag, oh, sorry. I'm going to drag in the second text box and put that below the everyday price. And this one's going to say you saved. You want to put dollars or colons there for formatting, whatever you want to, however you want it to appear. We can accommodate. So I've got an everyday price text box and a you saved text box. So if I expand my data section, I want to drag in the price one for the item. So the ticket line items, if I slide down, 
there's a price one field. And you'll, if you dig a little bit further, just to confuse you, if I look in the item table, I'm also going to find a price one field. I would recommend you not grab price one out of the item table. I would recommend you grab it from the ticket line table. And the reasoning for that is if you have oversized pricing, location specific pricing, um, those would be the two factors that would drive this, but if you have a unique price for the product, color size, or unit being sold, alternate stocking unit, alternate selling unit, you want the that unit's price one, not the item's raw price one. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to drag in that regular price one field and just drop it over here. And so I'm going to save my work before I lose it all. And now I have my everyday price, and that just prints zero as a placeholder, and I have a use save, and I haven't dropped anything in there yet for it. So when I print prices, I want to print my prices to have comma separators between the thousandth place and the hundredth place. I also want them to have two decimal places. So what I can do is I can format that price. So over on the right-hand side, where it says value, and it says the value is equal to the field of price one. If I hit the ellipse, I can modify that, and I can put in some formatting commands. And I'm going to cheat here. I've already got them pre-worked out, so you don't have to see how what an awful typer I am. Well, actually, everybody, this is this John's cheat sheet has been loaded up to the webinar as a handout. So if you notice the handout section, you can actually download this document and get access to all of his special genius formulas. And that way we can all cheat. We can all be cheaters, just like John. Isn't that what we all aspire to? Cheating? I don't know. Just oh, sound very moral. quick question about prices. Price one does not equal prompted price, correct? If you have a prompt for price. Correct. If the item is a prompt for price, whatever the price is on that item and or that item unit is what the price one would be. So a lot of times a prompt for price item has a price of a dollar or a price of zero. Mm -hmm. So price one is zero. So for a prompt for price, something, you wouldn't want that in there, right? We can suppress that when we get to the... Ooh, okay. And we're going to talk to, we're going to talk about suppression, as I mentioned in our introduction. So we'll get into that. Okay. So I'm just going to take what I had originally and put that over what I just pasted it for my cheat sheet. So my original price one was just going to print the price one value. And I'm going to add a bunch of stuff before and after that to reformat that. And so what I'm doing is I'm going to add a dollar symbol and a space, and I'm going to combine that or concatenate that with my price one field. But I'm going to fancy format word. the price one field. So I'm going to tell it we're going to format the following, and we're going to format that in this manner. And in this manner means what, what's in quotes. So we're going to format it meaning it's going to be all numeric values, all numbers. So the town symbol is a shortcut for numbers. So notice it's number, comma, number, 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 decimal point, zero, zero. So it's going to be all numbers with two decimal places. But that's a zero dot zero, zero. Yeah, so the last, it has to have at least one integer, or one, um, something in the ones place, okay. and something in the tenths, and something in the hundredths place. Gotcha. Um, and everything else can be. So I remember my decimals correct. Pound sign. Correct. I so think the pounds are optional. The zeros are non-optional. Gotcha. So I'm going to delete all that other stuff and leave in my pasted value. I'll save that again. So anywhere it says expression on there, you've basically pasted in a formula. Correct. Okay. So notice now it has a dollar symbol space 0.00. .00. Mm -hmm. If you don't like the dollar symbol, you could chop that off. But as Ariel mentioned, it changes it from what the field is to the word expression because it's got an equal sign on it. Anything with an equal sign or that starts with an equal sign is an expression. So 
So let's talk about hiding this. So if we're selling something at price one, we probably don't want to print the everyday price and price one because then the customer knows that they didn't save anything. And we don't want to print longer receipts with information that's not worthwhile that kind of discourages the customer from returning to our store. So over in the right-hand section, there's a hidden box. Mm -hmm. And we can create a formula that suppresses that field. Or we can copy a formula that <laughs> suppresses that field. So I pre-built a formula that I'll just copy in. And basically what I want to do is I want to suppress the price one field if the selling price is equal to price one. Now, a minute ago, somebody mentioned, and I don't know if Ariel repeated or she came up with the idea all on her own. Mm -mm. She didn't? No. It was not an I original I was going to give you credit. <laughs> I can't take credit for that. So if the item is a prompt for price item, uh, or it has a default price of zero, we might want to suppress that as well. So I'm going to modify this. What I'm saying here is we're going to suppress it if the price, which is the selling price, is equal to our price one. Or we might suppress it if price one equals zero. So I can either copy my field's price one value and paste it down here, or I can browse my data for that field. So if I click on my fields, I can slide down and find my price one field. And to move the, the column across, I have to highlight it and hit the double arrow. And it moves it across. So I've got a suppression that's going to suppress it if the price, if the selling price is equal to price one or if the price one equals zero. Now I'm going to get an error message the way this is laid out, or it's not really going to behave the way I want it to. And one of the idiosyncrasies of the RDLC editor is the entire formula has to be on one line, which makes it really hard to read. So a lot of times when I'm building a formula that has multiple components, I'll put each component on a single line, and then I'll put them together at the end. So I'm just going to drag that up onto a single line. And again, I'll save that. And if I preview that, notice since the prices were all zero, it hid them all. But notice it left the word everyday price there. So I want to duplicate that entire suppression formula. So whatever I have in hidden to hide the normal selling price, I probably want to apply to the words everyday price. So I suppress that line as well. So again, I can just copy and paste that and click on my everyday price, click in the hidden box, and paste it. If I look real close, you notice the, the red bar around the everyday price as opposed to the black bar around the you saved indicates that that's conditionally printed. Now if I preview it, the everyday price disappears. The next thing I want to do is talk about the you saved. And with the you saved, I can create a formula here that prints really anything I want it to print. So do I want the, use, the, the savings amount to be based on the individual unit or the quantity that the customer is purchasing? So if they're saving a dollar a unit and they're buying 10, do we want it to print that you save $1 each or you save $10? I think the you save $10 is a more effective uh, method of, uh, to print. So I'm going to drag out my text box. So I've got playground to start with. And 
And I don't want to print the word text box, I want to print a formula. And again, I've already pre-built this on the cheat sheet, so I can just copy and paste it. Well, actually, let's build this and then we'll kind of copy and paste it. Um, let's kind of build the formula from scratch. So if I want to turn a text box into a formula, the first thing we have to do is put the equal sign there that says, this is an expression, calculate something for me. And so I want to print the quantity sold times price. So in my fields, I can find the unit price, which is just the word price. Move that across. Asterisk is the time symbol. And I want to find the quantity sold. So that's going to give me the extended selling price of what was purchased. And this is a lot like algebra. If we're going to do some subtractions, we, need, we may need to use parentheses. So if I want to do that equation first, I'd put that in parentheses. But what I want to do is I want to subtract price 1 or subtract price from price 1 and then multiply it by the quantity sold to get an extended savings amount. So I'll open parentheses here and close the parentheses here. So I want to subtract that from price 1. I want to put the price 1 first. So over on the left-hand side, wherever my cursor was when I hit the double arrow, it moves the field over to that location. So I'm going to take price 1, subtract the price, so that's the unit savings, and then I'll multiply it by the quantity sold so I get a savings amount. And since my price 1 was 0, and I sold it for $1.50, the use saved is $1.50. And I need to flip the sign on that. Well, actually, I really wouldn't because the item would have a, would have a price. Um, and just like my price one field, I'd probably want to format that. So I'm going to copy in my preset up information. Just to compare what we did on the fly against what I had pre-recorded to show you that I really am doing this live. No, it's not quite there yet. So I'm taking my price one value. I did the other way around. That's okay. Um, but there's one other thing I want to include in here, and that is the total header discounted allocation. And this is the portion of a header discount. So I want to add that to the savings. So I want to show the line savings, whether it's a promotion or a price override, and I want to add to that any header discounts. I'm going to replace the formula I just kind of built on the fly with the one I did in advance, which is taking the price one times quality sold, minus the extended price, which is the unit price times quantity, and then I'm adding the header document discount. And I'm going to format that just like my price with a thousand separator and two decimal places. If I save and preview that, now I have a you save $1.50 or whatever the savings amount was. Now, if the savings is zero or negative dollar fifty, I probably, I definitely don't want to print that. 
So again, I can suppress that information. So in my cheat sheet, I've got a suppression built. So it suppresses it if the savings amount is less than a penny. If you want to make it less than a dollar or something that's you know significant, uh, so you're not you know posting that the customer is saving two cents, uh, you could just change that value. And again, notice the formula has to appear on one solid line. Any carriage returns will be seen as the end of the, the formula. And so basically I'm taking the formula and saying that it's less than a penny. It's really the same formula I'm printing in the field or as the field, and I'm suppressing it based on what, what it results in. And I might take that whole formula and copy it. And do the same thing with the you saved. So it doesn't print the word you saved if they didn't save anything. Now this is also really handy if you're doing returns. Returns wind up looking like negatives. So the customer didn't save anything when they returned something. So you definitely would want to suppress it on a, on a return transaction. We do have some questions about some of these statements. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure, because I'm going to repeat it back, but I'm not sure if I'm understanding what the question is. Um, can a visibility expression refer to other field visibility value? So, like, if something's sure. hidden. Sure. Okay. So, if we, you know... If, I can take the um, you know the everyday price field. So I have a formula in there based on uh, whether the selling price is equal to the normal price or the price is equal to zero. So in either case, we're going to suppress that. Mm -hmm. But we might want to equate it to something else. So maybe we don't want to print the everyday price on admission items or a specific type of item. So we might add another clause that says, or uh, item category or my item category code equals admission. And again, I'd have to put that on one line. So the suppression can be based on something unrelated to the formula or a combination of the formula and something else. I wanted to show you two other statements. Um, and a lot of these statements aren't things that I knew to begin with. Most of the things that I've learned on how to use this, I've learned by actually looking at the, the form itself. The form actually has great examples of a lot of this stuff. So, um, for example, in the payment section, um, yes, that's one. there's an expression in the payment section which gives us an example of what an if statement looks like. And an if statement allows us to change what gets output based on the value of the column. So the if statements are designed, it's kind of an XML format. It's very similar to an if statement in Excel, if you're used to writing if statements in Excel. Uh, first off, it's not if as an if, it's if, which is kind of a standard programming code. So this is capital I, lowercase if. If you write just the word if, it will not work. So So I did it wrong in my my intro. Right off the bat. So t obviously I'm not a programmer. Don't ask me for programming advice. So my if statement starts off with 
the amount is greater than or equal to zero. So this is a true or false question. And then immediately after that, we're followed by a comma. So the commas in the if statements, just like in Excel, they become the then or the else. So this reads, if true, then do this, else do this, or print this or this. So if the amount is greater than or equal to zero, we're going to print the pay code. And if it's less than zero, which would be the false equivalent, we're going to print the word change and the pay code value. Hmm. So that's the way the if statement works out. So if I was going to build one from scratch, um, just a silly one, um, <laughs> I've got one in here. Um, I'm going to drop this into my items section. I'm going to add a room here, so I'm going to add another line. Yeah, you're getting pretty jam-packed in there. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at either the unit price or the extended price. So I'm going to drag in a text box and drop that in on the line. Get nice and wide. And the text box field, I'm going to paste in my copy formula. So again, I'm looking for the unit price of less than $50 and the extended price of less than $100. So if they buy something less than 50 or total line of less than 100, we're going to print the word cheap items. And if, it's, if the unit price is over 50 or the extended price is over 100, then we're going to print the word big spender. So that's a cheap item. This one is a big spender. It's over 121. Because they bought nine of them. Correct. They are big spenders. We like them. <laughs> um, the last scenario, and I've really never had to use one of these in the RDLC editor, is something I use a lot of in SQL and occasionally in Crystal. Um, in Crystal and in SQL, it's considered a case statement. Um, but here, uh, and there's an example of one in here somewhere, um, it's a switch statement. And on the cheat sheet, I've kind of got an example of one, but I didn't work one all the way through. But a switch statement is another way of doing an if statement. So here's my switch statement from start to finish. So we say equal switch, and then we open parentheses, and then we close the parentheses at the very end of the statement. So based on the value, that we can have a list of things that we want to print or calculate. So if, if, the, if, if the value is 1, we're going to print, print 1. If it's 2, we'll print print 2. And we can keep going down that list. So it's really an if-then-else statement with many, many if conditions. And then... The final choice, which is optional actually, is a default value. If, if, if none of the conditions are met, then we'll do something else. What situation would you use this in? Uh, the example that's already on the RDLC form, it's really hard to read, but it's actually in the, not there. may have. I think I did. There is one, the, the you save message that counterpoint prints by default is a big select uh, or switch statement. And so it looks at the store configuration on the receipt tab 
there's a, a, a series of choices for what savings you want to print, whether you want to compare it to regular price, to price one, whether you want to pr print the percentage savings or the um, savings amount, uh, or just print price one, or print price one and the savings amount. So there's like 10 or 12 different options. And based on the, the option that's selected in the store setup, it prints the calculated value. Okay. Um, but the cheat sheet will give you an example of that, um, as well as the if statement. So that's 95% of what you would need to do. Some other things you might do in formulas, um, something I was poking around with for a support call today. Um, when formatting or playing with text, There's a couple of nuances you have to deal with. Counterpoint doesn't store the text in a text field. It stores it in what are called varchar columns in SQL. And a varchar, <coughs> excuse me, just indicates it's a variable length and it supports any printable character. So because it, it's a variable length up to maybe 50 characters or 80 characters, uh, we don't want to compare that 80 characters. We only want to compare the text that's in that up to 80 characters. So um, if we take a field that contains a var char, like maybe the description, that's a 25 character or 30 character field. But we want to trim the spaces out of that or trailing spaces out of that. So we might have to convert that into actual text or into a string. So when we're playing in the formula editor, uh, there are some key functions um, that are convert functions. So we may have to convert that to string. So we'll take whatever's here and convert that into a string value. So if I drop my cursor here and click on the convert to string, it moves over the formula and it puts a placeholder or a value in here which I'll chop out and replace it with the value that I actually want to convert to string. So it's going to convert the description into a string field, and then I can say it's equal to a value like admissions or blank or something else. So I can do equal, it might be greater than, it might be less than, not equal would be exclamation equal symbol, equal symbol. Um, so that's something you'll see in uh, certain places. Other things you might do with, with uh, something that once we've converted it to a, to a string field is we may do a substring command. So we might either take the left character or the right character or the middle characters. So if I wanted to take the left three characters of a field, I can do left, convert to string, comma, three characters, and close. We'll take the leftmost three characters of the description, or we could take the right three characters of the description, or we could take middle characters within the description using the in string command. So a lot of these are kind of standard um, formatting commands that you would find in Excel or in other packages. They work fairly similar. Um, with date fields, we can grab the day, the month, the, the weekday name, uh, the year. Again, there's examples. Uh, just looking at the formulas. Uh, so if, if we ask for the year of the posting date or the ticket date, it would give us 2018. Uh, if we ask for the weekday name of the ticket date, today that would give us a Wednesday. So that ought to give you lots of things to play with. I'd like to open it up for questions. Yay, let's do questions. I have some questions that have rolled in already. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to type them in because we're right about three o'clock Eastern time. But of course, we want to answer all your questions on the webinar, so we might go a few minutes over. So submit your questions. Um, whoa, all right, that worked. <laughs> Can there be different receipts for different stores? You can have different receipts for different forms, either through the form group. Different stores for different stores? Yes, yeah, so okay. on the form group, you can have 
different forms for different stores. So if I have this receipt, I can set additional rules based on ticket header and say that this applies to store main. And then I can have a different form, receipt two, which doesn't really exist yet, not on file, and again, applies to store east. Okay. So I would not recommend said. doing that. Why is that? I would rather, unless there's some major, major differences, I would rather build in formulas to print information based on what store it is. Mm. And that way you only have to maintain one form. Whereas if you have separate receipt forms for each individual store, when you want to make a change and deploy it out to all of those stores, that means you have to do it four times or eight times, depending on how right. many stores you have and store receipts you have. Now, so Unless you're using in the setup, what is it, setup point of sale stores, and you can set up some basic text at the top and bottom of each receipt mm -hmm. for the stores. It's mm -hmm. not as in-depth as the receipt editor, but it does allow you to add some custom lines yeah, based I, on the store. And I can, you know, add... If you don't like the store receipt messages, you could drag in text boxes and drop them either in the header or the footer, and then you could suppress them based on the store. So if the store is not equal to one, don't print that message. And that way you're only maintaining one receipt. Great. So um, in the editor, when you're creating your expressions, is that case sensitive, or can they write in all caps? or? For it example? is case sensitive, uh, particularly with the uh, commands. So, uh, for example, like the if command um, is case sensitive. The field names are case sensitive. Notice capital F, capital P, capital V in value. Um, the functions, capital C in convert, capital T, capital B, those are case sensitive. Um, but beyond that, no, not really. Okay. Great question. Um, okay, here's another question. We've answered that one, case sensitive. If there's oversized pricing, will it show on the receipt, I guess that person will show on the receipt the amount that the garment was extra in the price area? So, say for instance, like a size medium is going to be 10.99, but if they buy a 5XL, they're going to get a $4 charge, so their price is going to be 14.99. Right. So what's in the price column is the, the unit price that the customer is paying for it. Okay. So that would be the price value, which would be based on the 14.99 less any applicable discount whether they had a line discount code or a price promotion that gave them a 10% discount or their employee or a military member or something that gave them a discount. This price is based on the oversized price one less discounts. And that's why I had said when I printed the you know, everyday price, I wanted to print the price one field from the ticket header or sorry, from the ticket line section not from the item table because that would print the $14.99 as the unit's price one, not the $10.99 as the item default price one. Okay. Great. Let's see, do we have any more questions coming in? I answered them all. I think you did. Um, we'll give another, well, it's 3.04 Eastern Time. I want to make sure that we honor everyone's time today. It doesn't look like there are any other questions coming in.
I actually do have a couple of questions about labels. So I know that you all saw the title of this webinar um, on the invitation and on our website indicated that we would be covering uh, modifying labels or creating new labels. Unfortunately, um, that's something that cannot be done without the purchase of an additional piece of software called Nice Label. Um, it is something that customers can purchase. Uh, we have not had great experiences with customers using Nice Label to modify their own labels. Um, you know, usually what's modified is changing a description or kind of moving some things around, and that's something that our support team is more than happy to help you with. And um, I'm happy to open a case or have a consultation session with anyone that's looking to modify labels. Or my experience has been the, the cost of the software is more than the cost of having us modify it. Because it's a one-time modification, yeah. correct? Like, it's correct. not like people are saying, okay, yeah. every week I'm going to modify my label. They typically build their label and then they're set. And that's usually done as part of the initial implementation as part of our setup services. It also has a fairly steep learning curve uh, because some of the stuff may require uh, changes to SQL code that delivers the label uh, with, with data, uh, you know, a SQL query that combines item information and quantity received and cost and price information, uh, barcodes, uh, units, um, and, and changes to that requires some SQL knowledge as well as, you know, familiarity with the nice little product. Um, so another question about that, would all these rules for the receipts apply to labels as well? I'm going to go ahead and say the answer to that is no, because it's modified in a different program. Correct. And the, the whole formatting of, of the expression there is done in SQL. So the, um, you know, the whole syntax language is, is very different. And theory is the same, but you know the, the formatting of, of command structure is different. OK, great. Um, it looks like we've answered all of the questions that we've had come in. Um, of course, as always, if you have additional questions, um, you can reach out to your RCS account manager. So it would be either myself or Patrick Carmody, Darlene McQueen. We're all here to assist you with getting access to support resources. Um, you're welcome to reach out to support and open a case if you have additional questions as well. Um, if any of this it's tricky for you and you just want some hand holding or some help, John would love to help you with that. And we have um we have multiple technicians on our staff that are are well versed in in receipts. And we're gonna conclude today's session. I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know we ran over a little bit, so thanks for sticking with us. Thanks for all of the great questions. Um Check out our website to see what other new webinars we have coming up for the rest of 2018. And we're working on our 2019 webinar schedule as well. So we have some really exciting things in the works that I'm looking forward to talking to you about. Next month's webinar, we'll be talking about the newest CounterPoint releases, version 855 and 856. You're not going to want to miss those. NCR's really um, done a lot with these newer releases. So I can't wait to tell you all about what's coming up new in the software. Um, have a great day and thanks for joining us. <laughs>